Kithkit said. She has uh, assisted uh, visual photography and continues to work with film and silver gelatin prints. Uh, she has won Sanskriti Award for Indian Photography in 92 and Higashikawa Award in 2006 in Japan for Best Foreign Photographer. In 2008, she was honored with a solo show of her work Bombay Mix in France. I, I won't uh, pronounce the name, French name. Uh, uh, her work has been exhibited in India, UK, US, Japan, France and Spain. Her first book, Twin Spotting, Photographs of Patel Twins in Britain and India, was launched in 1999 to critical acclaim. Uh, selected images were exhibited in Century City at the Tate Modern in 2001. Her second book, a uh, culmination of 14 years of work, Bombay Mix, uh, street, Bombay Mix Street Photographs, uh, was launched in 2007 and has been exhibited in Tokyo, New York, and uh, France, Bombay, and Delhi. Thank you, Prashant, for inviting me to this festival. And I really hope it's the start of a regular feature because I can see by the crowd and the interest that this has been a really brilliant idea of yours. Um, I was a bit afraid when Prashant came home to ask me to speak whether, and he mentioned that the most of the audience would be very young, whether any of you would be really interested in someone who has 20 year old cameras and still uses chemistry and still hunts for tri film. But I guess that would make me history, so this is your history lesson. Um, I was very lucky to have been inducted into this field by the late photographer Raghubir Singh, uh, who died in 1999 and whose influence and generosity I feel enormously indebted to, and about whom I will say a few things in the course of the talk. I will back, uh, back and forth on time, because my early work has become my last book, and my later work has become my first book. So I'll be backing and forthing on time, and I just hope um, that's okay by you. Okay, please stand. Um, I'm married to a, a technical genius and I have absolutely no concept of machines except for camera. Yeah. And so he said that people would get very bored if I just speak because I'm not a natural speaker. So he said the best thing would be to break up the presentation with subheads. So I've called this a subhead, I've called this a subhead no hint because really there was no hint in my early childhood or in my college life that I would become a photographer. That I would become a photographer. And although I grew up in a home that was full of paintings and books, uh, photographs and photographers were not part of my family life. In fact, I can't remember my parents ever taking pictures of me, and the few pictures that I have, I think, have been taken by others. And although we had a house full of books, I had been exposed to a lot of books on the arts and artists, but photographers and photography eluded this list. The photo-related books that I do remember from my parents' bookshelves um, were Shiva's Pigeons by Stella Sneed, A Hundred Days of Photographs of JFK, this My People by Madanjeet Singh, but perhaps the most memorable title was Family of Man. You can change the slide now. Um, Family of Man, curated by the photographer Edward Steichen in 1955 for the Museum of Modern Art. This was 503 images from 68 countries, and I still remember this book from my parents' shelf. In fact, I've inherited it, and um, it's printed in graveyard tones, and I'll just give you an example of what a page was like. There's a picture of Cartier Bressons in there. If you turn to the next slide. The middle picture at the bottom is a photograph by Cartier Bresson. So this was an incredible exhibition, and I think it uh, probably opened up photography at that time. 
Um, on my parents' bookshelf was also a copy of Raghubir Singh's incredible first Ganga, published in 1975. Next slide. Which I saw much later, not knowing that the photographer was to become an important influence in my life. Uh, during the 70s and 80s, when I grew up, it was cinema that haunted most of us in our generation. In those days in Bombay, there were film clubs and societies that would show everything from Eisenstein to Tarkovsky, from Ozu to Kurosawa, from Ghatak to Ray, Gunuel Truffaut, Vittoria De Sica, Rossellini. And I say all this because I think a lot of um, the images that I was influenced to take on the street, I just remembered seeing all these great films at that time. Um, of course, once the VCR came, cinema came home and became a fix. Except for the photographs by Pablo Bartholomew of morphine addicts that I saw at the Jahangir Art Gallery at the time, and the rise of India Today as a premier news magazine with high quality pictures spearheaded by Raghu Rai, I had hardly encountered the world of photography, except for the occasional life magazines on the roadside. Later, when I got a second degree in communication arts and did a course introducing me to photography, I, I came back to Bombay, but then I worked as a journalist at the time with India, and then in Delhi, all this while taking my own pictures. It was around this time that I met Suni Tarapurwala, photographer, screenplay writer, and filmmaker now, but at that time, just returned uh, from Harvard and NYU, where she had majored in English literature, cinema studies, and photography. This was the early 80s. And when she showed me pictures, her black and white pictures of her family and community, the Parsis, you can move to the next slide. There are three pictures of Sunit. You can move to the next to the next. Um, that this really struck a chord and a lasting friendship. <coughs> okay, next slide. Okay, also in those days, I took every opportunity to travel across the country, always with my camera, and at that time, always in black and white. This then became a series of black and white postcards that, that I did. If you can just run through them. These were postcards that I did, and I remember my parents all the time asking, well, what exactly am I doing? And I'd say, I'm selling postcards, and I think they were really disappointed in the one thing where this was going to take. So I did a series of 18 postcards and actually they really sold well in bookshops. So these are just some of them. Next. And next. Yeah, I think, I think that's it. Okay, next, yeah. You can show the next slide. Suni soon introduced me to her friend Raghubir Singh. He had an intimidating personality and was impressed by Suni's Parsi portraits and used to bring her color rolls for a National Geographic assignment. Suni also told me stories of her days at NYU and of her professors and what great dark rooms she, they had. And she suggested I just pick and choose courses over a year. So I had just returned actually um, with my MA. Uh, between all these large dollops of photography and photographers, I found myself wandering on the streets of Bombay, just using freshness and enthusiasm and my first Minolta camera to create pictures. Um, next. Yeah, just show the first two, first two pictures. Yeah, this one, it was taken in the early 80s, and as was this, both on the streets of Bombay, and I'm pausing here because I think these two were the first real pictures uh, that I took that got the early endorsement of Raghubir Singh. In those days he would visit a lot in between his many books and shoots and each of his visits filled me with fear and trepidation and I wasn't sure if I wanted to see him again because he'd always say go closer you missed a unique moment you've completely missed the shot this is predict predictable work on form get the edges right learn from a good tennis game and there were times where I would actually weep as I simply chucked negatives that did not meet with his approval. I'm now going to show you some early pictures, which I hid from him because I knew it wouldn't meet with his approval. 
and uh, if you can go on to the next few pictures. So these were my early street pictures. <coughs> yeah, next. 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 Uh, many years later, I remember another great photographer who had a jazz musician's son and a ballet dancer daughter-in-law telling me in his typically unpretentious manner that photography was the least daunting of the arts because unlike performance arts where you need an audition and can be publicly rejected on stage or cinema uh, or cinema where you need a huge amount of money and to work in a team, in photography you're all on your own you can teach yourself by experience and you can just chuck your nets when they're bad and start all over again. I think this really suited me because I was much of a loner and um, it was something where I could just learn by experience. Um, it did help that I was somewhat of a loner and that I had, but I did have the freedom to shoot. And although my tolerant parents did not exactly understand or approve, they didn't stop me either. But by then, Suni and I were good friends, and she shared her books and pictures with me. We did an assignment for a Parsi magazine called Parsiana, and even for an Oberoi magazine, which took us to places like Pushkar, where we chased the lights and made pictures, but we made no money. We even went to an oil rig on an assignment for Imprint magazine to document the life of the workers on a rig. And we came back with pictures and two large fish that we caught on the rig. But it was really in America, in that one watershed year, 1984, um, when I think I decided I would become a photographer. It was that year that Raghubir was constantly visiting New York, and we became really close friends. At NYU, there were great sessions by A.D. Coleman and Rosalind Solomon and The Village Voice with Sylvia Plackey's pictures, and then those fabulous dark rooms and generous supplies of everything. Raghubi started taking me to shows, exhibitions, museums, homes of the photographers, Lee Friedlander, Bill Getney, William Christenberry. You have to remember that these were all pre-internet days, and the only way of seeing work was through books and museums. He introduced me to the Museum of Modern Arts Department of Photographs, where you could look at original prints from Archie to Winogrand, from the extraordinary collection that the then head of photography, John Sarkowski, had built up. And I'm going to um, show you the cover of my favorite book, which Mansi will just click. And it's called Looking at Photographs. And I'm sure most of you have seen it. And if you haven't, you must absolutely get it. It's a real Bible. Um, and it's 100 photographs. It's published in the 70s. It's 100 photographs from the collection. Of course, there are many more now. Um, but I think what made John Sarkowski great was not just that he was a connoisseur of great photography. He was a great photographer himself. But he also wrote unpretentiously and simply beautifully and I dip back into this book for all kinds of inspirations. So I'm going to show you two images from his collection. One is by the French photographer Eugène Archer, uh, who photographed Paris in the late 1800s and early 1920s. And if you move to the next image, um, this is in Versailles, and there's no date to the image, but I'm really, um, uh, I would really like to read to you uh, John Sarkowski's description of this picture. Archie's work is unique on two levels. He was the maker of a great visual catalog of the fruits of French culture as it survived in and near Paris in the first quarter of the century. He was also, an, in addition, a photographer of such authority and originality that his work remains a benchmark against which much of the most sophisticated contemporary photography measures itself. Other photographers had been concerned with describing specific facts at his documentation or with exploiting their individual sensibility, that is self-expression, 
Archie encompassed and transcended both approaches when he set himself the task of understanding and interpreting in visual terms a complex, ancient, and living tradition. The picture that he made in the service of this concept are seductively and deceptively simple, wholly poised, reticent, dense with experience, mysterious, and true. And the next image uh, that I'm going to show you from this collection is by Lisette Model, who, who um, taught at the New School for Social Research and taught Diane Alves. And she photographed, as many of you here probably know, um, a lot of very wealthy people and a lot of oversized people. And um, anyway, I'm just going to read about the gambler, which is this image. The gambler, tanned and sleek and self-contained, waits in the afternoon sun for the adventure of the night. His relaxation is pro provisional, like a cat's. His eyes watch the photographer as they would watch the dealer or the croupier, alert for a hint of slate of hand. His own hands are held appropriately close to the vest, cupped as though to gather in his counters. Model has made her photograph from very close and from a very low vantage point, which foreshortens the gambler's figure. It is an unfamiliar and menacing perspective. If she moves one step closer, he may kick the camera neatly from her hands. So this is one of my favorite books, and that's why I brought it here today. Okay, so we go back to NYU and those early years of studying photography, where I learned the ropes of the darkroom and photographed uh, my student project at the end of it, and unfortunately I couldn't find it when I was making this uh, presentation, was a series of portraits on Indian artists in New York, including Indrani Rahman, Krishna Reddy, Zarina Hashmi, Sheila Dhar, and Asha Kurlawala. So I did find the Asha Kurlawala image, so if you click on the next. And when I returned uh, from New York, I continued with the portraits, um, taking portraits of Mulgraj Anand, Pupul Jaikar, movie extras, uh, a tourist at the Oberoi. If you can just move, they're all there. So this is Pupul Jaikar. <coughs> Next. Mulgraj Anand. Next. This was a, a, a gangster in uh, Mohammed Ali Road called Zainabai Khabri. She was called that because she had become an informant to the police. And uh, look at the size of her hands. If you just go back, Perfect. huge hand. And she took me into her room and she showed me the pistol that was under her pillow and I was <laughs> shaking with fear. Uh, next. These were a pair of movie extras called Moti, uh, Manmoji and Chote Dada. They lived in a cave and they did these. So anyway, these were all early pictures. But it was during my NYU year that I also had an interesting encounter um, with a, a most incredible photographer called Helen Levitt, who died a year and a half ago um, at the age of 95. She was a street photographer, and all her years she only photographed in the East End in New York and in Coney Island. Um, and I'm going to tell you a very funny story about her if we just move to the next. Oh, sorry, this is still part of the early portraits. This was a okay. This was a tourist at the Oberoi in Bombay. Okay, Helen Levitt, if you just show the next image. Okay, this is an, I have the original print, printed by her in 1935, and it hangs in my house, and this is how I got it. Um, in my NYU year, I, um, went off with a friend to the west coast. We went by uh, Greyhound and car and all sorts of things. And by the time we reached the west coast, it was an old college friend of mine whose husband was in many, many businesses. And one of his businesses was rent a wreck. So he rented us a wreck and with it came a driver and we drove off to Las Vegas because he couldn't believe that these girls from Bombay had never uh, 
gambled and never been into a casino. So he said it was time that we learn. So anyway, we landed up at Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. And we had no idea what blackjack and pontoon or whatever. And we just, you know, we booked ourselves in a, a room in the hotel and then decided, well, we better learn something. So I just happened to be near one of those, what do they call those slot machines, Pablo, pinball machines or whatever they're called, which had pineapples and, you know, balls. And, <laughs> and um, so I put, I put several quarters in. And after my eighth or tenth quarter, just what seemed like a million came rolling out. And before I knew it, there were two men who were standing on either side of me. And they said, well, I have to come in now. I had hit the jackpot in this pinball machine. And I had to go to the gate and collect my money. So in the mid-80s, that was a regal sum of money that I earned. And because I was wanting to become a photographer, right? I said, I must put this money to good use. So I rang up my friend Thomas Roma in New York, who was a well-known photographer. And he used to play gin rummy on Fridays with Helen Levitt. And I said, Tom, do you think you can somehow tell Helen Levitt this story? And I would like to use this money to buy one of her prints. He said she'd love the story because she loves gambling. So I'll put it to her when you get back to New York. Um, I'll give you her address and you go up to her house. So then she was already in her 80s and she lived in a walk up um, near NYU with no lift on the fourth floor and she lived with a cat. And her kitchen was her dark room. And she summoned me up in a very crusty and brusque way and said that the only reason she was allowing me in was this gambling story and uh, also that she was curious about India. So I went up and she said, choose, choose one of these prints. So I said, well, I want a print that you've made um, uh, in, in your dark room. So this was a print I bought from my gambling monies and it still hangs in my house and I really treasure it. And it's called Girl with Lilies. And James Agee, who wrote the text to her book, A Way of Seeing, said this, of this picture and the other young girls um, in this sequence. Adolescence is a kingdom of fallen and still falling angels, but it is yet a kingdom, and of this picture, he said, with profundities of grave purity which are peculiar to it. So she had photographed lots of young girls and, uh, and this was one of them. Okay. Um, also at, NY, at NYU, uh, during those days, I worked at a photography bookstore on weekends called Photographer's Place. And this is where I acquired um, most of the books I still have today. I also got myself a second-hand lights, autofocus and larger, my tongs and trays. And then I shipped all this out to Bombay to start my own darkroom. By then I had the trusted Leica M6 with just a 35mm lens. This was still the mid-late 80s and photojournalism was at its peak and great photographers like Raghu, Mahin, Pablo were all represented by international photo agencies and were also doing personal work of their own. India today showcased some great images and thanks to Raghu they got the space and pages they deserved and brought photographs to the attention of a wider public. From Raghu, we saw Indira Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Bhagalpur, Bhopal, the assassination of Mrs. Gandhi, the Sikh riots, Gyani Zail Singh with his rose, and much more. And from Raghu B, if you can just move to the next few images, there are six of them. Uh, from Raghu B, we saw departure from the predominant black and whites of those days, <coughs> color and his painterly vision of Kashmir, his home in the world of Calcutta, Bombay in the 90s, bursting with glitter and deprivation. The ambassador Carr is an icon. You can keep showing. Through which he showed us India and his river of colors, all seen through his extremely sophisticated eye. In the 70s, Raghubir was considered one of the first to reinvent the use of color, when color was still widely disconsidered. just moved. Next. Yeah, that's it. Okay. 
um, now I was in my new dark room at home in Bombay after NYU and I was out on the streets all the time photographing. Raghubir's watchful eyes seemed to be around all the time, but the added bonus to Raghubir critiquing my work was seeing drafts of his own work, seeing his, his dummies and listening to stories about Banaras Gali, Satyajit Ray, Nirad C. Chaudhary, V.S. Naipaul, <coughs> and his close friend R.P. Gupta, the bibliophile. And I'm now going to show you early pictures, which then became part of Bombay Mix. If you can just, yeah. So these early pictures of Bombay that I took formed the basis of my book, Bombay Mix, which sadly came out only in 2007, eight years after Raghubi died. Here are some of the images that found their way into the book. I also photographed, okay, let's go through these. At that time, I also photographed uh, parties and functions and exhibition openings, and um, I called it the Highlight Series. I also did some Bollywoods, um, and I also photographed in Calcutta and Gujarat. So this is just a mixture of all of that. So I think you can just... was a woman breastfeeding, I mean not breastfeeding, feeding her baby in the midst of a glittering Parsi wedding. This is all uh, late 80s, early 90s. That's Yash Chopra in his office with his Oscars. This starlet called Suparna Anand. Minakshi Shisha. Yeah, just run. These are, this is just a mix of pictures. Okay, so Bombay Mix was launched and published by Devi Lewis Publishing in 2007, uh, together with Alkazi Sepia International, with whom I had a long association. This started in the early 90s, thanks to Mr. Alkazi, who visited Aurobind and me during Aurobind's Economist days in London, pulled out my prints from under our bed, came back the next morning to acquire them, and asked me to contact his newly started gallery, Sepia in New York, to show my work. This was the beginning of a 12-year 12, 12 association who visited. show you some that I did 
and I followed it up by uh, making a trip to visit my friend Aisha, who was sitting right next to me, um, who was posted in Moscow in Russia as well. So I'm just going to show you very few from this random mix. I think was Russia when I went to visit Aisha. Okay, but nothing really stuck. I needed something to bite into and it hadn't yet happened. By then, Raghubir was stationed in the UK too, in Brighton, staying with his friend, the art historian Partha Mittar. It was at this time that Raghubir was doing his book, River of Colour, with Fiden, and Aurobind and I got a ringside view of all that was going on, till his book came out. Um, I hadn't quite got the nerve to tell Raghubir of a very sort of odd subject that I had been drawn into. So I waited for four or five of his visits before I showed him the early pictures of the twins. So soon after I fell into the twins project, photographing Patel twins in the UK and India. <coughs> and I think if you, you can just show each picture for a second and I'll just keep talking and if you want me to stop. Um, <coughs> so when Raghuvi first visitor, visited us in London, I gingerly pulled out about 20 proof prints of these twins and his eyes shone with the highest praise I have ever received from him. Now this is unique, he would say. This comes out of your Gujarati roots. Go full swing into this. Don't stop. Just do it. Just keep looking. I want more. His encouragement really egged me on, as it was quite a jaunt to find all those twins, then travel to them, and then pray that the two were not apart <coughs> by the time I got there. Uh, then Raghubir would come back, look at more work, shift the couch in our small apartment, lay a sheet on the floor, and place the proofs like seeds in a garden, waiting to see this project go, grow. Go see August Sander again, he'd say, pointing to the National Portrait Gallery. See how he uses form. Look how he uses his edges. Go back to Diane Arbus. See the intensity of her work. Look at the dark portraits of Bill Brandt, and stick to your Gujarati roots. So the Patel twins was the beginning of a four-year journey, often accompanied by Aurobind, taking trains, buses, minicabs to remote places like Gravesend in the UK and Oor in Gujarat, chasing the light till it died on me, knocking on doors of strangers who welcomed me and hearing stories of immigration, displacement, bankruptcy, and divorce. These were testing and frustrating times too, like landing up at a Patel shop hours out of London to find one twin there and not the other, or missing a train at a desolate, urine-drenched station in some corner of Britain, or the dismal wintry rain snapping up any semblance of the sun. But I kept at it, and it became a sort of obsession. I met and photographed about a hundred sets of Patel twins, most of them identical, in Britain, and then later in Charutar, Gujarat. Have we done the 14 images of the twins? In Gujarat, finding and photographing the twins was a more familiar. Do you want to go back to some of the twins? Um, in Gujarat, finding and photographing the twins was a more familiar and easier experience. Luckily for me, Aurobind's cousin Karthik was a doctor in Anand, and I could stay with him, making it the base of all my travels. From the birth registers of all the hospitals, Karthik took me to, and with the help of an intrepid tra taxi driver called Harshal, I met and photographed another 50 sets of twins in 35 villages in the Charutar area of the Patels. I thought all this time about how Raghubir said, explore your roots and the photographs will come, and they really did. And so the book finally came to an end. That's the cover. 
It took another year and many versions of dummies before it found a publisher. And I think oh, for all of you who have published books um, here in front of me, you can really relate to what it's like holding your first book. Those years photographing 100 sets of twins all over the UK and Gujarat taught me the biggest lesson in photography. Keep at it. Keep it simple. Discover inner and outer worlds. Go to sleep satiated and the images of that, or with the images of that day and wake up only wanting to do more. When this happens, you know you are hooked. Don't be in a hurry to publish. Don't be in a hurry to exhibit. Just keep at it till you feel you can do no more. It helped that I had an incredibly supportive husband. I had loads of triax film and that I would catch trains and buses every weekend to various patels all over the country. It was also a novel way of seeing Britain. I would have never seen it this way. Uh, when we returned to live in Bombay in 1999, twin spotting was out, and we had a gorgeous daughter who brought a fresh, renewed sense of energy in my life. I also cleaned out my dark room and dug into all the old necks from the rugby days. To these, I added some more that I shot, and thanks to Sepia and Debbie Lewis, uh, gave birth to my second book, Bombay Mix, which then was shown by Bodhi Art in Bombay as a solo show and then travel to different parts of the world. And that's when, in 2007, after that, that when I was on a family holiday in Gir, I felt the need to start something new, and it happened on that holiday as I drove through a village of Siddhis in the middle of the Gir forest. And um, that became and is now my newest body of work. <coughs> Uh, there are 85 <coughs> pictures that I've put into a book. The book has two essays, um, and it's gone off on its long and arduous journey to find a publisher. And I'm very happy with all of Suni's um, tips and lessons this morning because um, I may well have to <coughs> um, steep into that if, if nothing works. So I'm just going to show you uh, 15 or 20 pictures from my new work. Siddhis are about 75,000 in India. They're mostly in Gujarat and Karnataka. 25,000 in Gujarat, um, about 20,000 in Karnataka in the forests. The more urban Siddhis live in Bombay, in cities in Gujarat and in Hyderabad. Um, they live almost exclusively. The ones in the bigger cities have intermarried. And um, I've traveled to all the city destinations in this. They came to India 400 years ago as uh, slaves, as mariners, as sailors, as traders. In Gujarat, they are Sufis. Um, this girl is from Ratan, which has the most the three most important dardas um, that the Siddhis worship. This is one of the dargas, and the drum is beaten at the time of the loban, and then they go around the darga. And this is the dhamal or the buma dance where they break a coconut on their head. Okay, sorry, that's that's it.
controversy with Pushma Mala and Bombay and all that. I mean, we were totally oblivious of any of this because in Bombay we just work very kind of, um, I don't know, maybe Swapan and Suni can uh, also add, but I think Delhi just has a greater buzz and that there are more, there's more opportunity to dialogue here and for people to come together. I think exhibitions draw larger crowds here. Um, I think in Bombay, I mean, maybe it's starting to build up, I don't know, maybe Swapan can, can speak on that behalf, but um, yeah, I was lucky to have Raghubi, but I do think the younger generation have lots of opportunities now, you know. This is actually the first photo festival in India. Yeah, but Prashant so. has been telling me how he and Sanjeev have been you know, meeting with photographers and looking at their work. And so That's all happened over the last 10 years. Okay. 1987-88, it was very difficult, I know, to get photographers together. There were two by two or three by two or one by one because people knew each other and trusted each other, but there was a big fear of showing your work to people and being criticized. But that's not the point. point is that but it does exist. You also exist. have that fear, no? Yeah, but, you know, you could deal with it. No. <laughs> it's very tough. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, I had Suni, and, and so that was, she was my pal. You know, but I, I must add that when uh, I talked to Suni about this first, about the festival, and her first reaction was like, look, I don't want to show in that. I want to mentor uh, people. So I think it's um, it works uh, both ways around. You know, I mean, I think there are a lot of lot of photographers who are willing to look at uh, other people's work, and I, I see that with not not just uh, I mean uh, Dinesh, uh, Kirti, and uh, me. We are all born 1957. You know, we exactly the same, and and Funi also. We all. And I think Pablo, we are all about the same age. 
But I feel a... Yeah? <laughs> 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 I was under 14. <laughs> But I see, I, I see people like Saurabh and Vidur who are doing the same thing now and they're much younger. So, you know, it's, it's, if, if, you're the, if people are open to coming and meeting people and showing their work, it'll happen. That's all. And I think that's it. Uh, uh, when, when I tried to thank Raghubir for all the help he had given me, he had once told me that when you're in the position to do it, you do the same for someone else. And so, this is my way of you know, carrying it on, and I think each one, teach one, pass it on. Mm -hmm. so, you know, the what the same thing about this? Uh, you feel the absence of mentors, or? Well, in, I ran a three-year mentoring program between 2001 and 2003. That was through the World Press Photo, but that was for mid career photographers who wanted to make a shift. And there are many different sorts of mentorings that can happen. It doesn't necessarily mean that it starts from zero, but there is mentoring at every stage. I may want to be mentored, you know. Sometimes you dry up and you need, you know, an external force to sort of push you in another direction. I will need mentoring in digital, so that's the way I'll probably now go. So I will need to consider. Yeah. How much of an influence was uh, Diane Arbus on your book on things? Um, you know, you know how I hit upon the idea, and of course I thought of her classic image. I was at a Diwali party in Kent. And I'm married to a Patel. It was a Patel Diwali party. We were living in London. And my dear husband, who just about speaks Gujarati, but didn't want to mingle with the, all the Patels, was pushed by me to go to this Kent party. And when we reached there, um, the Patels are very organized about themselves, from income to birthdays to aspirations to matchmaking to a caste system. So they came <coughs> out with all these tables for me, you know. And suddenly I saw that there were so many twins because there were, in any large community there are bound to be twins. I think it's one in 90 is an identical twin, I think is the statistic. So I did think of her classic image. And as I rode home that night on the train, I said to Aurobind, I really think this is the germ of something. And I had been doing so many random pictures that it was that night that I suddenly felt, and yes, her image was in my head, that I think something might just come out of this. So I guess she was an inspiration. It can reflect in your, in some of your earlier work of the gangster or something. Yeah. So uh, the first thing I saw that I said, it was kind of familiar. <laughs> You shot a picture from looking at photographs of the French photographer. Um, but you know, as a reader, when I'm, I'm reading the, the writer and I'm looking at the picture, many times it's not very clear, like the description is that this is a great picture for usually a very descriptive reason. Yes. And, if, and then if I, if I step back and say, would I have looked at this picture by itself and yes. recognize this to be a great yes. picture? And almost always the answer is not, not yes. always. Yeah, I, I entirely agree with you. And I was drawn into Archie by seeing all his work. So I think he's a very important photographer to see because of when he photographed, how he photographed. And uh, with no schooling, without any knowledge that he would one day have a body of work that he should. Um, and I think he just went about photographing uh, just details of architecture, details of gardens, details of doors and streets, which just give you a whole sense of what Paris and France was. But it took Sarkovsky's writing, because it's such simple writing. I mean, I only read out four or five lines. He has a page on him in this book. But it's very, you know, there are no big words in how he writes. And you can just... There's another one, uh, where, uh, there's an image of Brassais in this, of this uh, couple in, they, they're in a bar together and there's this mirror. And they look as if they're having a fight. 
and he writes so beautifully on what possibly may have been going on in their minds, which is not the photographer's <coughs> business, but in reading the picture, you can read so many things into it. So it's like a, it's it's like literature, you know, you just reading beautiful meanings into it, and yet Sarkovsky himself was a great photographer. So I think the one <coughs> follow-up question is. Is it always the case, can you always look at a picture and come to those conclusions as this is a strong picture, it's not a strong picture? For example, um, the example you might be talking about is, is it an old man approaching a young woman who might be getting fired or he might be approaching her as a proposal? There's one picture like that, I think. Uh, and in that, once you read the write-up, it makes sense, it looks beautiful, yeah. it, you know, that's, that, those are thoughts you have. But some of these pictures, you even after you read it, you're not entirely sure how to judge it as a great picture because maybe we are just not good enough yet to see the greatness of it. Yeah. But how do you say what picture is strong and not so strong? You know, I think it's also arbitrary. I, I just love this book because of the way it's written. But if I'm in an exhibition, there will be pictures that I like mm -hmm. and that you won't and that you like and that I don't. And I think that's fine. You know, I just react to an individual picture and if I can remember it, for a long time, that means I really loved it, you know. Um, and I, I really think it's, it's, for me, it's as simple as that. Uh, I don't get into theory and all that. It's just a suggestion, uh, actually, for uh, that when the festival is over, and you have the festival page, that maybe you could think about people who have contributed who might want to put in a, bi a bibliography or books that would be interesting for people because, you know, we still haven't really gotten to those courses in photography in India yet. And that uh, might help. That's a very good idea. Yeah. Very good. I think we, I mean, uh, uh, that's actually the national department because he's, he's the one <laughs> I'm the very good, but uh, we, we have to implement that. Just keep it on, yeah. And it, uh, it's on. Uh, I'm from Saurashtra in Gujarat and I recommend a book written by Dr. Chauhan. It's ah. called uh, uh, Africans in India from Slavery to Royalty. And they've been coming here, they've been brought by the Arabs and the Romans for more than 400 yes. years. Oh, more than 400 years. All along the West Coast. Okay. And there's some mind blowing facts there. There are Hindu blacks as well in Karnataka. Okay. Yeah, I know. I photographed the Hindu black, and they're Christian black. Christian blacks, so yeah. Many Muslims. But Karnataka doesn't have Muslims. They were all no. Hindus and Christians. Muslims are further up. Yeah. But uh, another interesting <coughs> fact is that slavery to royalty at the time of independence, there were four or five Nawabs, black Nawabs, getting killed. Yeah. Which is yeah. a, a lesser known fact. And some of them. Uh, the fort of Zanjira. Yeah, they're still there, the family is still there. And they have also family in Sachin, in Gujarat. So I have four years there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's another book also, since you, uh, it's by Mappin, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi, I was just wondering, Kirki, I'm here, right? Um, I was just wondering, um, it was really interesting to see your presentation but it was also really actually really lovely and interesting to hear you because I don't know if you had prepared what you were speaking but it was actually very beautifully written and I was wondering if uh, if you've ever written and if you've ever looked at, uh, at, at the word as, 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 as language. I mean every artist obviously is also looking at form and I guess some people work better in photography, some people work better in painting, some people work better through, you know, by writing. I was just wondering if you'd ever written anything before, because, you know, especially that part when you were talking about Los Angeles and the gambling, and, and there was one beautiful line about the sun and something about it sinking or something like that, which is really beautiful. I was just wondering... I did write it, and I took many days to write it, and it took everything out of me. And I had many fights with my husband, who was then dealing with the machine side of it. And I also had many problems scanning. Um, and so I decided that if I keep this anxiety up, I won't be able to speak unless I prepare it. So I prepared it. I'm not a natural 
uh, ex tempo speaker. So just to keep safe, I, I, I wrote it. But it took a lot out of me. I, I've done it now, no? <laughs> Can you tell us more a little bit about how it was being mentored at whatever level by Rav Gandhi? And if, um, you know, what one must expect when one, one is looking for a mentor? And how does one, you know, if you have to pick the mentor and they have to pick you. How does that relationship come about? Actually, it didn't work that way at all. And Suni won't remember but I was working for Imprint magazine and I had done a story on Pablo, Mahindra, Suni. It was just a very silly story. I was so embarrassed when I saw it the other day. And Raghubir did not, he saw the uh, article in Suni's house or in Suni or whatever and he, he said, who is this stupid person who has written all this? So Suni just immediately protected me and said, oh, you know, she's just starting and this is her interest in photography. So he showed no interest in me. Then when I went to New York and Suni said that I was then a student, maybe he was just, he contacted me and I was so scared when he called and he just said, let's see how serious you really are. And, you know, what do you know and all that. You know, just because you're doing a course at NYU and everything. So he then started taking me to see exhibitions and to libraries and to see books. Um, because there was no, no net and um, maybe he was also looking for company for someone to go with him to see all these shows. It can be quite lonely actually being a photographer. <coughs> all of us can uh, vouch for. So I think we just became friends but he was always so superior and I was always so inferior that we just kind of naturally fell into this mentor-disciple uh, relationship. Um, but I think once he saw that I was so serious and that I really started taking pictures, then he even took it upon himself to tell, I think many of you will know how difficult it is to convince parents when you're in your early 20s. Because I didn't have a photographer in my family as Papa nor Pablo did. So it was very difficult to, you know, for my parents to think I was going to spend the rest of my life doing this. And I think once Raghubir saw that I was serious, he then brought this level to the house so that then I really had the freedom to work. And uh, yeah, he would look at contact sheets and he would tell me to chuck negatives. And, uh, have, you, have you mentored any young uh, photographers like this? No? Next question, would you? Yes. <laughs> You know, I'm always looking to learn and I, I had a young girl who was with me for uh, three months and I learned so much from her on, you know, uh, on the computer and how to do Excel spreadsheets and put my images into them. And then she came with me on my Siddhi shoots. Um, so I think it would work both ways. I, I would be very happy if someone came and I would want it to be a exchange thing because there's a hell of a lot I have to learn. <laughs> Do you photograph the streets of Bombay now? No. Not at all? No. Because my next question would have been, um, has the quality of your photographs changed because the landscape has changed, you know? Some of the best street photographs we see are from the 80s, and after that it's been very hard to find uh, photographs of that level. Yeah. I haven't done it again, but what was quite interesting was that when my book came out in 2007, CNN, IBN, said, they rang me up and said that, could, could we go to four or five of those locations now and see if they were the same and then zoom in on the image and zoom in. And actually all the locations were exactly the same. So we just had people stopping us. When we were at Ban Ganga, some MLA came up and said, this is a Hindu dharm jagha and how can you take pictures? And then we were, when we were at Balkeshwar Road where those nuns were walking, 
suddenly the Afghan consulate came running to me, running to CNN, saying, you can't film this. This is a consulate, the Afghanistan consulate. And then we were in Marine Drive, where I had photographed lovers. And now it was just full of people. And the cops came and said, what are you doing taking pictures here? So I think that freedom, uh, you know, that, I mean, you can still photograph in Bombay, but things have changed more than places. I think the attitude of people has changed. I think there's a lot more vigilance. Uh, you know, lovers sitting on rocks and all, which was the thing everyone did in those days. Now there's, you know, the cops coming. And so that, I think, has changed. And of course, the high-rises and all that everywhere, all the mainland's gone. But the actual life on the streets, to me, you know, if you go, go down, P.D. DeMello Road, which is the longest road in Bombay with, uh, with all the slums. To me, it's exactly the same. So, yeah. Um, I, I really wanted to thank you because uh, uh, your entire presentation came across as very candid, uh, especially when you were talking about uh, how intimidated you were when you went to senior photographers. And uh, a lot of people have brought up this uh, talk about the mentor. And uh, I have been pursuing photography for some time, not getting anywhere with it. And I realize uh, it, it's, it really helps to have somebody experienced talk to you. And very rarely you come across people who are willing to give you the time. So I, I just wanted to say thank you. and. Uh, you also said a few things about patience and not being in a hurry to publish and exhibit. And uh, I've heard that from a lot of senior photographers in this room before, and uh, it, it helps. I think it does because yeah. we've all tried it. And we've yeah, seen it's, it's really been. difficult, but uh, I, I guess it makes a lot of sense when you are at it for a long time. So, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Kirti. Thank you very much.